Angelo's last talk and also the last talk of the series of the This Went to School. Thanks. <laughs> okay, yeah, well, thank you for sticking around till the end. So, can you hear me? Okay? Yeah, okay. So, for this last lecture, I was having trouble deciding what to do because uh, there were lots of requests about rings of Rankin. They were all sideways. So, so people ask me if I can talk about the geometric picture, if I can talk about rings of Rankin over other base rings, if I can talk about the connection with Lie groups and pre-homogeneous vector spaces, if I can talk about one of the applications, why, why I was thinking about this in the first place. Um, what happens for n bigger than 5? Do I have any idea? And about the non-commutative cases. So, so I was having trouble deciding what to do based on these requests. So in an attempt not to disappoint anyone, I thought I'll do all of them. But it may end up being that <laughs> I disappoint everyone as a result of it. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> I won't I'm gonna spend about 10 minutes on each. Okay, so let's see how that works. Okay, so I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, about each of these things. So okay, so I'll start with the geometric picture, because that, that's what I was just getting to at the end of the last lecture. So the geometric picture. for n equals 3, 4, 5. So I already mentioned for 3 and 4, so what happens when you have a binary cubic form, which was what was parameter, right? So this is the case n equals 3. You have binary cubic forms. And if you take its roots, they're roots in P1, you get roots in P1, and you get three roots in P1, right? A binary cubic form has three roots in P1. In the case n equals 4, what was happening geometrically and the point was that these roots are going to be defined over the cubic field where the order, uh, where the order sits. So when binary cubic form corresponds to an order, and that order is going to sit in the cubic field that's cut out by these roots of that binary cubic form in P1. Uh, for n equals 4, remember, orders in quartic fields were parameterized by pairs of ternary quadratic forms. And again, if you take the roots, of this pair of ternary quadratic forms. What does that mean? A ternary quadratic form can be thought of as a conic in P2. And so a pair of ternary quadratic forms means a pair of conics. And so inside P2 here, we get a pair of conics. And by Bayes' theorem, they intersect in four points. And the point is that that order that we were defining in terms of a pair of ternary quadratic forms is an order inside the field cut out by one of these roots in P2. So n equals 3 corresponds to three points in P1. And n equals 4 corresponds to space that cuts out four points in P2. So what's happening at n equals 5? So you can guess that you're now going to get five points in P3. That should be what this space is parameterizing somehow geometrically. Uh, so the space we're looking at is quadruples of 5 by 5 skew symmetric matrices, right? alternating two forms and five variables. So there, it's not obvious <laughs> where, where the five points are. Right? There's skew symmetric matrices, and you have four of them. Okay, how do you get points in P3? Um, so let's think of this as quadruples of four skew symmetric matrices, five by five. Then what one can do is one can make this one matrix, five by five, namely, you take A1, T1, plus A2, T2, plus A3, T3, plus A4, T4, where T1, T2, T3, T4 uh, are just indeterminates, just variables. Right? And we make this 5 by 5 skew symmetric matrix. So this is a 5 by 5 skew symmetric matrix. Right? So this is a skew symmetric matrix. 5 by 5 skew symmetric matrix of linear forms. in T1 through T4. And so we can take the determinant of that, and we get 0, <laughs> right? Okay, you remember that. Okay, so it's not useful to take the determinant, but you can take a principal 4 by 4 minor, 
right, on the diagonal. There are five ways to do that, right? A principal four by four minor is going to be a skew symmetric four by four matrix, right? So principal means on the diagonal, principal four by four minors. And by minor, I really mean, since the minor is going to be a determinant of a skew symmetric matrix, even dimensional, it's going to be a square, right? So by minor, I actually want to say the square root of that, so it's what I call a sub -fafian. So the square root of a principal four by four minor. They're going to be, well, first of all, the determinant will be a degree four form in T1 through T4. So the square root will be a quadratic form in T1 through T4, right? So our quadratic forms. in T1 through T4. Yeah, so let's call them, say, Q1, Q2, Q1, Q2, up to Q5. So these Q1 through Q5 are quadratic forms in T1 through T4, right? And the point is that so the QI the QI define uh, the QI define uh, how do you say quadrics in P three because it's there and four variables right so they find quadrics in P three and these quadrics in P three they intersect you can guess in five points. <laughs> That's a, that's a geometric fact that you can prove, that if you take four, skew by, four five by five skew symmetric matrices and you form these five quadratic forms, they'll always intersect in five points, generically. Right? And, and the order that we were defining, uh, that quintic order that we were defining, is going to be an order in one of those fields cut up by uh, one of these, uh, these five points, okay. these common zeros of these five quadrics. <coughs> So I can't draw the picture because I don't know how to make a three-dimensional picture, but you get uh, you get five points in P3. Okay, so that's a so basically what was happening here is that we were finding in each of these cases we were finding ways of parametrizing three points in P1, then four points in P2, then five points in P3, and so it's sort of clear what you want to do next if you want to go higher. So okay, so if you want to go higher, you know what to do geometrically. <laughs> okay. Okay. Any questions about the geometric picture? Is that Yeah, it's really the pencil. That's right, because GL two is acting on it. So you're looking at that two-dimensional space of of conics, right? This is the pencil of conics. Uh, and here also, yeah, you have a five-dimensional sort of. Yeah, well, it's not. It's not a very. I mean, it's, its dimension is not. <laughs> yeah, it's just a zero-dimensional pencil, I guess. <laughs> Here it's a one-dimensional pencil, here it's a four-dimensional. You don't call it a pencil, you call it something else. Okay, so yeah, so that's so basically geometrically these these spaces were parameterizing uh, how to get uh, endpoints in P n minus two. That's what was going on geometrically. And so there is actually a uniform way of understanding the case n equals three, n equals four, and n equals five, just in terms of looking at endpoints in P n minus two. And so all these six topics that I'm talking about today, obviously I can't talk about them in detail, but for any of these, if you're interested further, uh, there are references that I think are fairly accessible. So I'll uh, be happy to uh, give you those if you are interested. Okay, so that's the geometric picture that I wanted to talk about. All right, next topic. <laughs> okay, so, so I wanted to talk about other base rings for just a little bit. So we've been talking about rings of rank n over z, but there's no particular reason to keep your base ring z, and it's often actually useful to have other base rings. Uh, so one can actually, one can of course define a ring of rank n over anything, over a base ring. What do we mean by that? Well, again, it's a commutative, associative. Uh, with unit ring, and we don't insist on things being free because 
there are modules over T, rank N modules over T that may not be free. Uh, but in order for a lot of this theory to go through, without much change, you, uh, you just need it to be locally free. So ring of rank N over base ring T uh, for me means a commutative associated ring with unit uh, that is locally free. Um, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> which, uh, which definition of locally free is good? On some open cover. But they're not equivalent there. Well, okay. They're not always. Okay. Okay, so that was a subtle question, a good one, which would take a long time to. <laughs> okay. So, okay, but uh, yeah, you take your favorite definition depending on what you're proving. That's locally free of rank n over t. So the point is, depending on your definition of locally free, you can um, define binary cubic form uh, over T uh, in an appropriate way so that the correspondence between cubic rings over T and rank three rings over T, that correspondence still holds over an arbitrary base ring T. So all these parameterizations Uh, over z can be naturally extended uh, to an arbitrary base ring by combining the geometric perspective that I just talked about Uh, with the algebraic, with the algebraic constructions that I talked about in these lectures, uh, so one shows that they're consistent, and one can then um, use them together to treat uh, treat the case over an arbitrary base ring T. So how the invariant theory and the geometry comes together when you're talking about a base ring T is, is it, it turns out very beautiful, and so this is this is work of uh, Melanie Wood, who's the TA for these lectures. And so if you have more questions about uh, how, how this works in general, uh, feel free to ask her. OK, so that's that topic. <laughs> so this is, this is going to be Melanie's thesis, so there'll be a reference available soon as well. So. OK, let's keep it up for a sec. So in fact, Melanie not only looks at a base ring T, but you can, you can take an arbitrary base scheme if you're talking about an arbitrary base ring. And so it's going to be used to classify degree 3, degree 4, degree 5 covers of arbitrary base schemes. So it seems like something that could be useful. OK. OK, so I want to mention a little bit about connections of these parameterizations with Lie groups, with exceptional Lie groups in particular. So, so suppose G is, I can even take it to be simple, but uh, yeah, so let's, let's just take a simple algebraic group. And suppose P, you take a maximum parabolic uh, in this Lie group. P, so let P be a maximal parabolic. So P, so if you know about the theory of Lie groups, uh, maximum parabolic can be decomposed right. So where L is the Levy factor. And you, so L is the Levy factor, and U is the unipotent radical. Uh, 
And this levy factor, L, acts on the abelianization. So I apologize if you're, don't, you're not too familiar with these things, but I'll make some pictures that'll, mm -hmm. that'll help. So L acts on the abelianization of U. It's called V uh, by conjugation. And the point I want to make is that with appropriate choices, of G and P. One gets representations. One gets exactly the representations. L acting on V, not discussed in these lectures, in the first three lectures. And there's a theorem of Vinberg that says that geometrically L acts on V. Uh, with an open orbit. In other words, essentially one big or one big or one Zersky open orbit. So L acts on V with 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 a Zersky open orbit. Which essentially means that there's only one relative invariant. If there is a relative invariant, it'll be just one. So we saw for binary cubic forms, there's just a discriminant. For pairs of ternary quadratic forms, there's just a discriminant. And for quadruples of alternating two forms and five variables, there's just that one discriminant that I talked about. So L acts on V with a Zersky open orbit in any such situation. And the converse is true too. That almost, I have to say almost because there are a couple exceptions, but almost every such representation every such open orbit representation, which is called a pre homogeneous vector space. So almost every such open orbit rep representation arises this way. This is the theorem of Satu and Kimura. Uh, so, sorry? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so these are ways of constructing representations that have like one big orbit when they act. And there's a theorem of Satya Kimura that says the converse, that almost every such representation where you have a Zariski open orbit arises by taking this kind of Levy factor acting on a unipotent radical. And but there's a there's a condition. So what do we mean almost every such? You have to put conditions on this. There, we're only looking at irreducible representations. We're looking at things that are called reduced, and we're looking at things that are reductive. So there are a lot of conditions. So with those conditions, then the converse is true. But otherwise, it's not. Um, OK, so that's some, something I wanted to mention. Uh, so maybe I'll start making a little bit of a picture. So, so which G and P do we take? And what representation do we get? So, so the first one I want to mention is G2. So if you take G2 and you take the maximal parabolic corresponding to, say, this vertex, so this is G2, then the representation you get of the Levy factor acting, so the Levy factor is just going to be a GL2. And the representation you get is binary cubic forms. If you take if you take f four, and next or parabolic corresponding to that vertex, then you get GL two cross GL three, and the representation you get is pairs of ternary quadratic forms. So the point is all these representations are coming up. They're connected intimately with a certain exceptional Lie group. 
Any guesses for the quintic? Yeah, it's actually, it would, be, it would have been nice if it was E6, but <laughs> if you go to E8, <laughs> and you take this maximal parabolic, then what is the Levy factor? It's GL5 cross GL4. So you have GL5 cross GL4. And it's acting on quite, and if you work out the Levy, I mean, if you work out the unipotent radical, you get quadruples of five by five skew symmetric matrices. So that's kind of intriguing. So for some reason, these three representations that were so important in classifying cubic, quartic, and quintic rings, they arise, for, they arise naturally from G2, F4, and E8, respectively. And so for a long time I thought, okay, well then maybe it's not possible to go beyond N equals 5 because we sort of run out of Lie groups. <laughs> But the point is that not every such... Okay, so why do, I, why do we care about the representations that have an open orbit? So one reason is that if we take a ring of rank n over z, uh, just a generic ring of rank n over z, if you tensor it with c, uh, you're going to get c cross c cross c cross c n times, because c is algebraically closed. So over c, what are the ra rings of rank n over c? Well, there's essentially one non-degenerate one, namely c to the n. So if we have a way of parameterizing rings of rank n, then over c you expect to have an open orbit because there's essentially just one such object, ring of rank n over c. And so that's sort of a reason why we were getting these representations that just have one open orbit. And by this theorem of Sato, Kimura, and Vinberg, every such representation that was reductive, irreducible, uh, and reduced has to come from a Lie group in this way. Uh, that's a, th that's a theorem. It's not understood why that's the case, <laughs> why it always has to come from a Lie group, but it's a theorem that they all do come that way just by brute force uh, classification <laughs> of the exceptional Lie groups and of the prehomogeneous vector spaces, these, these representations that have one open orbit. Uh, but the point is, if you, if you take away these assumptions of the representation being reductive or being irreducible or being reduced, uh, then that classification is not true anymore. It's much bigger. There are a lot more such representations. And so, so I was saying, people were asking, well, what do you think about n greater than 5? Okay, I used to say, as propaganda, I used to, okay, it's not possible that n equals 5 because exceptional Lie groups ran out. But I don't believe that anymore. So, so when people ask me hope or no hope about n greater than 5, <laughs> I used to say no hope because E8 is the last exceptional Lie group, but now, uh, now I've changed. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason is, so one won't be able to just have reductive, uh, irreducible, reduced representations, but there are many other representations in the world, uh, and a lot of them have been coming up for me recently that are not reductive, that actually parameterize very interesting things, and so it's very possible that n bigger than 5 is actually possible to parameterize. You also don't even have to take a representation of a group on a vector space, it could be a representation of a group on a flag variety or on a quadric, okay, so there are many other, many, many other possibilities. Uh, I think the solution will have to entail this algebraic geometry of endpoints in Pn minus 2, uh, and some of the combinatorics of n will certainly be involved, but I think uh, I don't think it's hopeless anymore, as I used to. <laughs> uh, especially since many, many uh, uh, representations that don't come in this way have been coming up uh, in interesting parameterization problems lately. So, Okay, so okay, those are two more topics. <laughs> Any other questions about that? So, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, and it's very beautiful. Uh, the common tricks of six and six are actually is very, very pretty. S six has this outer automorphism that should be very, very useful. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think it's exciting. Any n equals six is a very exciting case. Hello. <laughs> okay, so, so I've been talking about this problem because I think it's sort of interesting in its own right, but the reason I actually started thinking about it, uh, well, there was, a, there was an actual reason, uh, not just for its 
inherent interest, but there are actually a lot of, if one can understand rings of rank n, then there are actually a number of applications. Uh, any single case of n that one understands, uh, it, can le it leads to a lot of, uh, lot of interesting applications. Uh, the first is this fundamental problem in analytic number theory. Uh, so in, uh, in algebraic number theory, the most fundamental object is the number field. And, it's, and yet, we have very little idea of how many number fields there are up to a given discriminant, say, or having given invariants. Uh, so these parameterizations of n equals 3, 4, 5 uh, allow one to obtain exact asymptotics. So again, I'm happy to give references for any of these things. Uh, so one can obtain exact asymptotics for the number of, say, S3, S4, S5, uh, number fields. Uh, of, of discriminant at most some number, so of bounded discriminant. So <clears throat> these parameterizations for n equals 3, 4, and 5 respectively uh, allow one to obtain exact asymptotics for how many number fields there are of these, having these kinds of Galois groups and, and up to a given discriminant. So, well, I guess I should have said S1, S2 as well. <laughs> <laughs> since we did do n equals 1 and n equals 2. Uh, and the counts for these are very classical. <laughs> S1 was understood a long time ago. <laughs> S2, uh, S2 is also very classical uh, since the time of Gauss. Uh, well, shortly after Gauss, when people started talking about quadratic fields, uh, this was understood. Uh, S3 happened a lot later. This happened in about 1970. This is the theorem of Davenport and Hilbert. So there's, a, there's an old conjecture There's an old conjecture that says that if you fix, uh, if you fix Sn and you ask for the number of degree n fields that have Galois closure Sn, that that should grow linearly in the discriminant. Uh, that's an old folk conjecture. It was known for S2 and S3. It was false for S1. And uh, so it's now known for S4 and S5. Uh, so these are new cases, uh, and, and it turns out that it, the conjecture is true for S4 and S5. The constants that appear in the asymptotics are actually very meaningful. Uh, they're local products that sort of look very much like these, uh, the Ziegel mass formula for representations by a quadratic form. It's sort of an analog uh, for these counting number fields case where you get these other products that involve local masses for local extensions. So these constants actually turn out to be uh, very, very interesting as well. Uh, okay, so that's that's one, asympt uh, that's one uh, application to asymptotics uh, of understanding how many number fields there are of small degree. Uh, sort of a very fundamental problem in algebraic number theory. Um, the other thing is, once you have a parameterization of rings of rank n, then... So you can use parameterizations of rings of rank n Uh, to develop parameterizations of the class class group elements. So class groups, of course, are another fundamental object of uh, algebraic number theory. And so one wants to understand, for example, how class groups are distributed, what kind of class group, uh, how particular kinds of torsion are distributed in class groups. And so if you have a parameterism that brings a rank n, the next step is to then take uh, find parameterizations of rings of rank n together with some extra structure, for example, a class group element. So this is what I was, uh, this is what I sometimes call higher composition laws. Uh, so uh, in the papers that I wrote on this, uh, and the applications of this is that, for example, uh, one can prove uh, certain things about the distributions of class groups. Uh, so one can prove, uh, for example, some cases of the Cohen-Lenster heuristics for class groups. of fields and of orders. Uh, 
So here I also could have said fields or orders. So because we're parameterizing rings, we can actually count orders as well as fields. Okay, so that's a uh, so that's another application. There's another analytic number three application. I don't know how many people are. Okay, so, okay, let's see. So there's this conjecture of SER that says that, so people, I think John has defined the notion of an automorphic form uh, of a given weight. Uh, the case of weight one is, is particularly interesting. Uh, and to every such weight one form, weight one automorphic form for SL2, there is a notion of conductor, the size of the form. and there are certain kinds of uh, weight one forms which are called exotic. Uh, and exotic ones are classified of three types, icosahedral, uh, octahedral, and tetrahedral. And so there's a conjecture of Sarah that says that these kinds of exotic weight one forms don't exist that often. They're kind of rare. Uh, and so in particular, the number of weight one new forms for SL2 of, con of conductor some prime of conductor p is not too big. So it's like O of p to the epsilon. Okay, for any epsilon bigger than zero. So I mean the exotic ones. So there are exotic ones that are uh, that don't exist that often. So using this parameterization of, of rings of rank four, one can actually handle one of these exotic cases uh, <clears throat> on average. <laughs> so, so this can be proved on average. On average. For octahedral forms. For octahedral forms. So as p varies, you can prove this uh, for octahedral forms. So this is this was in joint work recently with Eknat Khate, G H A T E. So one can and so this is using using the n equals four case that I talked about. So there's a natural way to attach a quartic ring to an octahedral form of conductor p, and then one bounds the number of those that, things that can exist using this parameterization that we have for n equals four. Um, so actually, something stronger is proven, namely that the number of set forms is at most 10 on average. <laughs> so it's actually much smaller than P to the epsilon <laughs> on average. <laughs> okay, so okay, so those are sort of three analytic number three, uh, algebraic number three applications. Um, I don't know how many analytic number threes there, but maybe should I mention one more analytic number three application? <laughs> So this is kind of interesting. It's something that was done recently by a Princeton graduate student. So it can prove uh, some cases of the Katz Sarnak philosophy. So I think Sarnak talked about this at a previous Arizona Winter School. So I thought I'd bring it up. So, so Katz and Sarnak have this philosophy for the distribution of zeros of L functions. So, for, in particular, for Dedekind zeta functions, one can ask Dedekind zeta functions for number fields of degree less than or equal to five, for obvious reasons. <laughs> so, one can prove some cases of this philosophy for Dedekind zeta functions. The distribution of zeros uh, have to be have, be have a certain symmetry on average, and uh, that's recently been proven by a student of Peter Sarnak at Princeton, Andrew Yang. And again, this, uh, this uses this parameterization of ranks of rank up to five. And then uh, computing their Dedekind zeta functions and seeing what happens on average, one can sort of prove these, these conjectures of katz sarnak in those cases uh, for the low-lying zeros of these Dedekind zeta functions. So again, I'm happy to give references for any of these things if you're interested. Um, so maybe I'll mention one other thing involving automorphic forms. So one can develop a theory 
uh, Fourier coefficients. So we talked, we've we been talking about Fourier coefficients for uh, automorphic forms in SL2. Uh, suppose one talks about automorphic forms for other groups, like the symplectic groups, as John was talking about, or other exceptional Lie groups, for example, G2 or F4 or E8, or any of those exceptional Lie groups. Uh, is there a notion of a Fourier coefficient uh, for Fourier expansions uh, for automorphic forms in such groups? So, in fact, one can develop a theory of these kinds of Fourier coefficients. Uh, for various exceptional Lie groups. And in particular for the lectures that I was uh, giving here, uh, particularly, so I thought I'd mention this since I made those Dinkin diagrams, so particularly G2, F4, E8. <laughs> it turns out that the Fourier coefficients in, for each of these cases are indexed by cubic rings, quartic rings, and quintic rings, respectively. So this uh, case G2 has actually been completely worked out using the case n equals 3. This is by Gann and Gross and Sabin. Uh, in the case F4, uh, it's getting closer. It hasn't been completely resolved yet, but it's been uh, a lot of significant product, uh, progress on it by Michael Volpato, who was a student at Princeton uh, a couple years ago. He's now at uh, UCSD. Uh, E8, we're waiting for that to happen. It's very big. <laughs> so I think Gan is also working on uh, this F4 case right now. Uh, okay, so these are uh, these are some sort of analytic number theory applications. So, I mean, algebraically, it's sort of clear that this was an interesting problem. But for analytic sort of uh, problems, uh, these parameters, this algebraic parameterization of rings of rank n have have been quite useful. So actually, there are a lot of other things that. Uh, have been going on recently, uh, some by people in this audience, uh, but the work is in progress, so I won't uh, talk about it right now. Okay, so. Okay, I think I did five of the six topics already, so I'm doing well. Okay. Okay, any questions about any of these things? So I'm happy to give references if, if people are interested in these kinds of uh, topics. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to talk about is, okay, so I mentioned n bigger than 5, what might happen, but there's another way one can go, which is if one drops the commutativity condition and asks for rings of small rank uh, that might be non-commutative. And there's certain kinds of non-commutative rings that are uh, that are particularly interesting, especially to people in this conference. I wanted to talk about a couple of those cases. Is it okay if I move this? Yeah. All right. So I wanted to mention a little bit about quaternions and Actonian rings. So what is a quaternion ring? So again, we're doing everything over z, and if, with the goal of being able to do anything over an arbitrary base ring. Okay. And so if you can have, if you have universal, I mean, the reason to start over z is that if you can have universal constructions that work over z, then there's a good chance that they'll work over an arbitrary base. So, okay. So what is a quaternion ring? So a quaternion ring. So first of all, I mean, it should. If you tensor with q, you should get a. I mean, you want it. You want it to agree in non-degenerate cases with the usual notion of quaternion algebra that we have. So a quaternion ring, so let's call it, usually use the letter H, uh, so over Z. So is an associative, so we're not saying commutative this time, okay, so an associative ring with identity, okay, with the unit. That is, so satisfies a couple of natural properties that you'd want a quaternion algebra to satisfy. So first of all, it should be free of rank four right, as a Z module. Uh, it should have an involution, right? A notion of conjugation, right? A notion of uh, 
So it has an involution. That is has an involution. That doesn't sound very good. Sorry. <laughs> so it has an involution. Say alpha goes to alpha star, which fixes which fixes z and fixes only z. I mean, it's fixed. Uh, it's fixed subring is z, which means that every alpha in H satisfies a quadratic polynomial. Right, so that's what we have. That's what happens in a quaternion ring, right? Is that uh, everything satisfies a quadratic polynomial, and what is that quadratic polynomial? It's this f alpha of x. Give my x squared minus alpha plus alpha star, x plus alpha alpha bar. Right, so this is a polynomial in z bracket x. Okay, so you have an involution so that uh, each element satisfies uh, this. Oh yeah. Thanks. Star. Uh, sorry? Oh, yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah, so it's going to be, yeah, this. I think John gave a talk about this last week. He calls it a standard involution, but it has, yeah, it has that property. And, and the last property is that if you look at the characteristic polynomial of alpha, If you look at the characteristic polynomial, what do we mean by the characteristic polynomial? You look at alpha multiplying, right? The multi times alpha is a map from H to H, right? It gives you a four by four matrix. Its characteristic polynomial is going to be some degree four uh, polynomial, right? The characteristic polynomial P alpha of X is going to be a degree four polynomial. And we want it to satisfy. So this is actually a very important condition. We want it to satisfy that P alpha of X is just, is the square of, uh, of this minimal polynomial. Okay, so the characteristic polynomial should be just the square of the minimal polynomial. So this happens for any quaternion algebra that you take over a field. Uh, and so we want these things to be true for a general quaternion ring over z. Uh, but now we're allowing some degenerate kinds of things. Okay. So we're not insisting that the discriminant be, discriminants defined the same way, we're not insisting that it be non-zero. Okay, we take any, any discriminant quaternion ring, this is what we mean by a quaternion ring. So the question is, so how to parameterize quaternion rings? And what's sort of great about quaternion rings is that it can be handled in very much the same way uh, as the cubic case, as the n equals 3 case. So it can treat this case. Similarly, 10 equals 3 case. In other words, you write, down, you write out the multiplication table, and you try to figure out some set of coefficients that determines everything else. And that works perfectly well uh, in this case as well. So uh, maybe I'll actually do it. Yes? OK, I think I'll do it. OK, so. So take a basis. 1, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, for h. And so remember that trick we did in the cubic case where we had omega and theta. We can translate omega by something and translate theta by something so that the coefficients of omega and theta disappeared when we multiplied. You can do the same kind of thing here. So you can translate, you can translate alpha i by appropriate constant, appropriate element of z, so that coefficient of uh, alpha i minus 1 in this product, alpha i minus 1 times alpha i, uh, that, that that vanishes. So when you multiply alpha i minus 1 times alpha i, you can translate alpha i by an appropriate amount so that when you multiply these two things, the coefficient of alpha i minus 1 in the expansion of this product uh, that will disappear. Right? So that's just like in the cubic case, we did that. Okay. 
That's right. Yeah, yeah, right. So yeah, so alpha i are ordered cyclically. cyclically. Yeah, mod three, mod three. Okay, good. So one can assume that, and then we can write out the multiplication table. So the multiplication table looks like so alpha one squared will be some u alpha one plus l, and alpha two squared will be some v alpha two plus m, and alpha three right because alpha one squared is going to satisfy a minimal polynomial of degree two. So when you multiply alpha one times alpha one, you don't get anything but a constant and a multiple of alpha one, right? Because alpha Right, the alpha i satisfy quadratic equations. So when you multiply alpha 1 with alpha 1, you won't get any alpha 2 or alpha 3. Right? That's just this assumption that everything satisfies a quadratic polynomial. Right? So alpha 3 squared, you can assume some w alpha 3 plus n. And then alpha 2 alpha 3, you can assume some minus a. So I'm putting a minus just to make things work out. Well, later, so plus r plus d alpha 3, right? Because remember, we translated alpha 3 by the right amount so that there's no coefficient of alpha 2. So we can write that. And similarly, we write alpha 3, alpha 1. We can assume is minus b alpha 2 plus some constant s plus some e alpha 1. And we can do alpha 1, alpha 2. Is minus c alpha 3 plus some constant t plus f times alpha 2. And by Noam's comment earlier, uh, you can figure out the opposite multiplications by, by applying the star, the star involution. Okay, so you can figure. So this is basically all you need to know in order to specify the quaternion ring structure. And so now, just as in the cubic case, we see what does the associative law imply if you say equate alpha 1 squared times alpha 2 with alpha 1 times alpha 1 alpha 2. Right, what does that imply? And so if you just write that, write out those relations and you solve, you find that the associative law implies uh, the following set of equations. So L, L is determined, it's going to be minus BC. M is determined, it's going to be minus AC. And N is determined, it's going to be minus AB. And similarly, D, E, F are determined. D is AU, E is BV and f is cw. Okay, so just for u, v, w, a, b, c, they, if you fix those, then that, that determines l, m, n, and d, e, f, just by using the associative law identities. And there's one other condition that we didn't use, which is the characteristic polynomial condition, that the characteristic polynomial should be the square of, of the minimal polynomial, and if you use that characteristic polynomial condition, Oh, you're right. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So these constants are determined, and these constants are determined. And that's just like in the cubic case, right? The constants were determined uh, by by the coefficients of. Um, okay. And the characters of polynomial condition uh, implies that d e f vanish, right? So d equals e equals f equals zero. So if the characteristic polynomial is going to be the square of the minimal polynomial, then that implies that these three things actually vanish. And that's just a straightforward calculation. You just, you just work out what that means, what this condition means, and that just implies that those three things vanish. And so what that means is that these guys, this u, v, w, and this a, b, c, they determine everything else by the associative law and the characteristic polynomial condition. And conversely, if you fix any six values for these things, uh, and then let LMN and RST be as uh, by these rules, uh, then you actually get a quaternion ring. So this is a bijection, just like in the cubic case. It works out very, very similar to the cubic case. And so, and so you get this. You get this theorem. Uh, so one thing I didn't say. Again, in the cubic case, we found that those four coefficients determine everything else. Then we have to see what happens under change of basis. So here also, if you let GL3 act on these six coefficients, how do they behave? They behave just like the coefficients of a ternary quadratic form. <laughs> so GL3 acts on, if you change the basis alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3 by, by an element of GL3, uh, then it 
the ternary quadratic form, ax squared plus by squared plus cz squared plus u y z plus v x z plus w x y. So if you associate to h the ternary quadratic form ax squared plus by squared plus cz squared plus u y z plus v x z plus w x y, then you find that gl3 acts on this ternary quadratic form exactly as it would if you let gl3 first act on the basis and then see what constants you get. Okay, it transforms exactly that way. Just like in the cubic case, when you looked at those four coefficients and you let GL2 act, it acted just like the coefficients of the binary cubic form. Okay. So, so what this proves, well, I get the, this theorem, which actually goes back to Hermit. In the case of, um, the case of non-degenerate quaternion rings, so actual quaternion orders, orders in quaternion algebras over Q, this theorem goes back to Hermit. Uh, but then there was a lot of further work in extending it to other cases, uh, ending with very recent work of Lucianovich, a student of Gross at Harvard, who just noticed that this just works totally generally. There's no sort of reason to, um, uh, to eliminate discriminant zero rings. So, so Hermit did this in 1854, and then this is around 2000, I think. <laughs> and theorem is just that quaternion rings so this theorem was greatly simplified by this condition that of this characteristic polynomial being the square of the minimal polynomial. So that was sort of um, what allowed this sequence to finally be finished. So quaternion rings over z up to isomorphism are in one-to-one -one correspondence with ternary quadratic forms. Up to GL3, Z action, appropriate GL3 action. And the correspondence is just, well, you take those coefficients and you just make this multiplication table. <laughs> and if you have this multiplication table, you just read off these coefficients. So that's the explicit way to do it, but what is the, uh, what is the more conceptual way? Well, if you have a quadratic form here, you send it to, we've seen this construction here, so I wanted to mention it, you take the even part of the Clifford algebra. It agrees with that construction. <laughs> So if you take a ternary quadratic form, you take the even part of the Clifford algebra. That's exactly what we just computed here, okay, explicitly. Okay. okay, so that's the case of quaternion rings. So that's the, that's the answer for quaternion rings. Okay, so one thing that you notice is that we went straight to ternary quadratic forms. Right? Now, what happened to binary quadratic forms? So there's something interesting. Okay, so everybody knows about binary quadratic forms. So in the case of binary quadratic forms, remember, so if you take binary quadratic forms modulo the action of GL2Z, right, this is a theorem of Gauss. This is called Gauss composition. If you take binary quadratic forms up to GL2Z action, those are in one-to-one -one correspondence with quadratic rings. So orders, quadratic orders, but in general quadratic rings. And, ideal, and an ideal class in that quadratic ring, ideal class. So this was something I was wondering. Well, if you, there's a natural map from binary quadratic forms to ternary quadratic forms, right? So, uh, no, I wanted GL2. So if you take this twisted GL2 Z action, if you twist by the determinant, then it exactly corresponds to ideal classes in quadratic rings. You don't get any narrow ideal class and you can take the full GL2. So, so I mean GL2. And there's a natural map from binary quadratic forms uh, to ternary quadratic forms, right? Like if you take a matrix A, B over 2, B over 2, C, then that, you can send that to, well, you put one on the top and you just make, you make a form of the same determinant. Uh, and what does that mean on the level of S comma I going into a quaternion algebra, right? So that's saying that you have some S comma I and that naturally mapping to some h. What is that h? Well, it turns out h is just s direct sum i. <laughs> so if you take a quadratic ring in an ideal class and you take the direct sum, it turns out that has a natural structure of a quaternion algebra. Right, it's rank four. <laughs> right. And s is the subring, 
S acts on I because it's a module, and you can use that those relations to actually define a natural quaternion structure on S to X and Y. So I can actually define it for you. So so if you take S and S, so let's say you take T S and S, and you take I J and I, then S times S is going to map to S S S. So this is the quaternion. I'm using dot to talk about the quaternion algebra map. So s dot s is going to be just s times s. s dot i is just going to be the natural action of s on i. And i dot s, this is the tricky thing, is it acts by the conjugate. So s bar, the quadratic conjugate, will act on i. Oops, sorry. And i times j is going to just be i times j bar divided by the norm of i. Minus i times j bar. So these are just natural. These are just natural maps that you can use to define a ring structure on S direct SMI, and that's a quaternion algebra. And in fact, you can use this injection of binary quadratic forms into ternary quadratic forms, corresponding to this s comma i going to s direct SMI to get a quaternion algebra. You can actually use that to make this this multiplication table that I made earlier. So just by using Gauss composition and this map from a, a quadratic ring in an ideal class and taking the direct sum and getting a quaternion algebra, you can actually construct this multiplication table. Uh, so one could have discovered this just from Gauss composition and adding an extra variable and making this ring structure. Uh, so the reason I wanted to mention that, so, okay, so last slide. Is that I have this, I had this theorem in my thesis about two by two by two cubes. So people were asking me to mention something about this. I just want to say this at the end. If you take two by two by two matrices, uh, modulo the action of GL2 Z cubed, then this actually has a nice, this parameterizes some, a nice set of objects, namely a quadratic ring together with three ideal classes. So this is a quadratic ring. And this is a triple of ideal classes whose product is the identity, whose product is trivial. So the space of cubes, two by two by two cubical matrices, naturally parameterizes quadratic rings together with three ideal classes whose product is, the, is trivial. So the observation is that if you take the direct sum of these four objects, this, has, this naturally has the structure of an octonian ring. So I won't define what I mean by an Octonian ring, but if you, I'm sure you've seen Octonian rings, and this naturally has the structure of an Octonian ring. You can see these qu Quaternion rings inside, namely S to XMI1, S to XMI2, S to XMIC. So those are, that multiplication structure is in place. You just have to figure out how to multiply different IJ with IK. And so this has natural structure of an Octonian ring. And what does that correspond to in terms of uh, these representations? What it corresponds to, so this goes to like this Octonian ring, and what that corresponds to on the representation theory level is that z tends to z2 tends to z2 tends to z2 has a natural map into wedge 4 of z7. And the theorem is that if you take wedge 4 of z7, the space, it's 35 dimensional space modulo the action of gl7, that this is a one to one correspondence with octonian rings over z. Right, so this, is the, this map here is the analog of the map binary quadratic forms into ternary quadratic forms. This is what it works out over here, is that this, this cube space maps naturally into wedge 4z7 because there are four factors here, and 1 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 is 7. So this corresponds to octane rings over z up to isomorphism. And this was discovered uh, by sort of generalizing that previous thing of s to x and y gives a quaternion algebra, s to x and three ideal classes whose uh, products is the identity gives an octonian algebra. And so you can work out the multiplication structure here and then expand it into wedge 4z7 and you get a way of taking an element of wedge 4z7 and making an octonian ring. And conversely, if you have an octonian ring over z, you can construct a wedge 4z7 in a similar way that I uh, did the Hordic and Quinta cases, re recovering multiplication structures. So, okay, so that's what I want to say about non-commutative rings. <laughs>
maybe since I'm the last speaker, I should also, on behalf of everyone, thank the organizers of, the, of this workshop. Thank you so much for... They, they actually worked way harder than we did, so... <laughs> <laughs>